Motion capture is an extremely powerful tool for animation, and it's not right for every project, but when you can use it, it can save a ton of time, especially if you're not an animator, but you need to put animation into something you're working on. But as most animators know, the key to getting great motion capture data is not just putting on the suit and then using the raw data, you wanna do something with it. It could be small tweaks, it could be massive changes. And sometimes you just really wanna push and customize what you get to make it feel more stylized. But because not every animator has worked with motion capture data and most non-animators are not super familiar with these animation workflows, in this video, I'm gonna go over the three main fixes that I think most motion capture would benefit from, at least in terms of what I usually see. Those three categories are creative, functional, and technical changes, or more specifically for our examples, posing, jitter, and contacts. This will be like the feet contacting the floor or hands contacting objects, things like that. All the mocap data in this video is gonna come from a Rococo Smart Suit Pro 2. I've used that suit in a few videos previously and now Rococo is sponsoring this video. But I thought Rococo would be a good kind of test case to use for this video since they're typically the most accessible option in terms of price. And that's especially true if you're considering their Indie Creator Bundle, which is basically a 40% discount on their motion capture gear. So for all the independent creators who are looking to get into motion capture and start exploring this stuff, this is probably one of the best options to consider for getting into mocap. Which, by the way, since they're sponsoring this video, if you add that on top of the bundle, you end up with a 45% discount across the entire package. There's a link and the discount code in the description down below, and now we'll jump into the good stuff. So first up, creative changes. What happens when you want to push poses or change what the performance actually looks like? Now, as far as changing poses goes, it can be a big creative thing or it can actually just be a small functional thing. For example, if you have maybe your shoulders are just kind of dipping down in a weird way, this happens a lot with MetaHumans and Unreal Engine. If you want to just kind of correct those shoulder poses, or maybe you've got hands that are clipping through parts of the body, you've got a lot of intersections going on, that's a fairly straightforward change. Instead of messing with all this dense keyframe data, it's much easier usually to just add an animation layer and make your tweaks, and it'll just change the animation on top of all the existing data. This is something you can do regardless of software, my app, Blender, Unreal Engine, anywhere you can mess with motion capture data, this is something you can do. How you do it is slightly different, but as you start to get more advanced and you wanna make bigger changes, the experience in these different tools is gonna to change a little bit more. So let's say we go big. We wanna take a character who's running and jumping. We wanna make them jump higher, jump farther. We want the poses to be more interesting. It can take some time, but it's not all that hard to do. Now, the easiest way to do this is not to be messing with all the original dense motion capture data. That's a lot of keyframes to go through, and typically you'll wanna clean all this up anyways before going on to tweak stuff and change poses and get more into it. If you want a video on cleanup, by the way, let me know in the comments. That's kind of a big topic. It won't fit in this video. So if you're interested, let me know. I typically prefer to work with a non-destructive workflow, meaning we keep all that original data intact to not need to worry about all those individual keyframes or all those different curves. We get a fresh set of curves and keys and we can do whatever we wanna do that just builds on the original foundation. But like I said, there's a lot of different workflows to tackle this sort of thing. And I cover a lot of them in my Maya for Animators workshop, as well as my Animating in Unreal Engine 5.5 workshop. Links are down below. But you can see the before and after of what this can look like. And if you wanna practice this, this is a clip from Rococo's motion library. I didn't even capture it. They have a bunch of different assets, a lot of them that are free that you can just grab and you can try these things. Now for a functional change. This is probably the most common issue that you'll see in motion capture performances. It's the biggest giveaway that someone didn't know what to do with the motion capture data, or maybe they didn't have time to mess with it and clean it up properly. You never know, but it's a big red flag and you want to avoid this at all costs jitter or noise in your curves that just has things moving around and shaking for no reason. If you try to hold perfectly still and your data just looks like this and everything's just kind of moving around a little bit more than it should, that's not great. And to be fair, there are different reasons why that might happen. Sometimes it can be the suit's fault. Sometimes it's user error, whether you're using a dedicated router for your hardware, the list goes on. That's a whole another topic on troubleshooting. But the goal here is to get rid of the jank and be left with just the performance that you actually wanted to capture. If you skip this step, it'll be a lot more obvious that you're using motion capture. Now, the first thing you can do to help with jitter is back when you're recording, calibrating the suit properly, working with the router, there's a lot of stuff like that. And then the pre-processing step, once you've recorded in that software, for example, Rococo Studio has a whole pre-processing step that does a lot of stuff, but ignoring all those things, you've got the data in your software and it's kind of moving around. What do you do? There's actually a lot of different cleanup tools. There are smoothing filters that will help to average out the motion. You can change how much or how little. If you wanna fix the little bumps in the curve editor or if you wanna just really smooth out the motion and mellow it out. There are peak filters to chop off any big spikes in the data that might happen. And just so you don't get the wrong idea, I added this spike myself, these little jerky motions to the arm of this character. That was not in the original data. I just needed an example to show you. And if you really wanna get in there yourself and do some custom work, you can simplify these curves. There's different tools, algorithms, Anambot has something like this to help simplify the curve and reduce the amount of keyframes that you actually have to work with. 
Also, buffer curves. Buffer curves are fantastic for this workflow. This is still something you can use layers for. There's a lot of different ways people tackle this process, but one of the big things you're gonna wanna learn is how to troubleshoot where a certain motion is coming from. If you're trying to diagnose a certain action or a certain motion that you don't like and you wanna dial it down, it can sometimes be tricky to pinpoint where exactly that's originating from. Personally, I like to mute controls so I can see exactly what each individual curve might be doing if I'm trying to locate a specific problem. Now, one thing I wanna call out here, when you're doing this kind of cleanup, I personally don't mind having to deal with like arms and large parts of the body that you can see really easily and you can just mess with a few controls. It's the fingers and the hands that I don't like doing this process for because there are a lot of controls and all the different finger joints across both of your hands, especially if you have multiple characters in your scene, that gets very not fun very quickly. So I actually wanna call out one of Rococo's products that helps with this a lot. I've been using it for a couple of months. I really like it. It's the Coil Pro. It's this little base station you just plug into power and it automatically connects to the software and the gloves and things like that. It sends out this electromagnetic bubble and it basically gives you really accurate global position for your suit, your gloves, for whatever's in that bubble, even if you have multiple characters or people in suits doing stuff together. But for me, the main thing, it really reduces how much drifting, how much jitter, it increases the quality of the capture by a lot. So you can see this example of what normal jitter can look like, but if I take a separate pass of just the hands using the coil, you can see that there is way less motion. They're way more stable. I didn't have nearly as much to clean up when I was working with this data. And you can see the hand interactions, just kind of knowledge of where the fingers go, prop interactions, all this kind of stuff gets way stronger when you're using the Coil Pro. So if you have the smart gloves or you're thinking of getting the smart gloves, consider this, especially if this is something you do for work, because this reduces the amount of time you have to spend working with that data by a lot. Because the easiest way to deal with jitter is to have as little of it as possible from the beginning. Now, finally, contacts. This is probably the most obvious thing that people struggle with with motion capture. Whenever you see the feet not really locked on the ground and you get a little bit of foot sliding going on, maybe the hands and the props that they're holding just feels kind of stiff and weird. And the reason for this, especially with the feet, is because all of motion capture is just FK chains, meaning you get an exported skeleton of animation starting with the hips, and that's the only thing that really moves around. Everything else is just rotational data. So the feet aren't locked down. They're not using an IK controller or locator to put them in position. It's the legs, the knees, and the, the ankle, I guess, all rotating together to create that pose. So if you wanna make an adjustment to where that foot's planted, good luck messing with that on every single frame and making it feel convincing. It takes a little bit more understanding of how to animate a character to be able to take that data and then work with it in a more intuitive way. This is why people struggle with it so much. Your best case scenario when it comes to the feet is to switch from FK to IK. Now you can't just do that with the skeleton. You have to have some setup steps first, depending on your character, your software, your workflow. There's a lot to cover here, which we don't have time for in this video. Now I do go into all of that in my My Effort Animators Workshop, as well as my Animating in Unreal Engine 5.5 workshop. But to give you a quick example for this video, I'll take a character, put a rig on it using mGear, which you can download for free, and bake all the motion capture data onto it. From here, you can actually snap the entire range of keyframes from FK to IK using the mGear rigging tools. From here, this is basically a normal animation. I can use layers if I want, or I can mess with the original data, but either way, I'm now in the territory of regular character animation that I'm comfortable with. And trust me, that's a lot easier than it sounds if this is all new to you and that sounds like a lot, it's really not that hard. No matter what you do, your goal is to put the feet in IK. And again, links to my Maya and Unreal workshops down below. And now for the hands. This is another, the better the data, the better your life is gonna be situation. But keep in mind that when we hold an object, we don't just put a death grip on it and then it stays exactly like that. I don't wanna, there's water sound, so I don't wanna shake it too much, but we don't just death grip and then, you know, it just stays in that exact orientation all the time. This is what you see a lot in motion capture where people will get a hand pose, they'll take an object, they'll set a constraint, and then they just keep it like that. In reality, we'll flex and loosen our grip, we'll readjust how we're holding things. If I go and, you know, move this around, I'm gonna adjust my hand position. I'm not just gonna hold onto this and never mess with it like a toddler with a crayon, right? You have a little bit more finesse with your fingers. This is why using something like the smart gloves is really handy because you, <laughs> handy. That was not on purpose. Anyways, this is why using something like the smart gloves is actually gonna be really handy can't do it again. Something like the smart gloves is gonna be really helpful to capture all that motion, even if you don't have your props being tracked, because then you can always, you know, offset and animate that yourself. But that's a big thing, is that your, your prop objects, they usually will have offset animation of their own, which gets into constraints and all that kind of stuff. And I have a video coming up on the perfect constraint workflow. So subscribe if you haven't already.
but this is gonna make your props and hand animation feel way more convincing. An honorable mention goes to the eyes. They obviously don't make physical contact with most things, but they are the emotional contact in terms of eye direction. Having your characters look at other characters, look at certain objects in your scene, whether they need to stay locked on to keep the character grounded in the world you've built, it's all the same stuff. Everything you've learned so far can apply. Then you might use layers or something to do another pass and make sure that they are locked on when they need to be and doing their own thing when it's necessary. Keeping in mind that the eyes are still tied to other parts of the face, that's another video, but the eyes are a big part of that sort of contact conversation. If you're cleaning all this stuff up, you can't forget the eyes. Ignoring them is your quickest way to fall down the uncanny valley. You know, Montezuma, the king of the Aztecs. Also, in addition to my workshops that go through my workflows, Harvey Newman actually has an entire workshop dedicated to his workflows when it comes to working with motion capture. And he's got over 10 years of experience working in games. So if you're interested, you can get a totally different perspective on how you might approach these kinds of things, especially if you're interested in hearing more about the game side of things. I'll have a link to his class down below as well so you can check it out. I've bought it and I'm really excited to watch it, but I haven't had the time yet and I didn't want to accidentally steal any of his tips for my video. So if you want another perspective on this topic, you can check out his workshop. And a huge thank you to Rococo for sponsoring this video. I've got different videos on my channel of when I use their stuff for the first time, if you're interested in that. The promo code that they've shared with us for you to save some money if you decide to pick any of this up. And if you have any questions on anything in this video, please let me know in the comments down below. As always, thanks so much for watching. I'm Sir Wade, and I'll see you in the next video.